Our scripture today comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. This scripture invites us to examine our own salvation. Hear these words. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight this day. Amen. There are a bewildering number of biblical translations out there. The CEB, the NRSV, the ESV, the NASB, the KJV, the NKJV, the NIV, the NNIV. Well, that last one isn't real, but did you doubt me? There are a lot of translations out there. I barely scratched the surface of what there is available. But I still wish there was one more, just, just one more. I wish there was a translation of the Bible into the southern U.S. dialect of English. Because there is a, a profound truth in the grammar of southern English that most of the rest of the English-speaking world misses out on. Which is, there is a difference between you and y'all. Y'all get what I'm saying here, right? And, and while this is a helpful feature of our dialect of English, the truth is most other languages have y'all too. There's no special dialect of Spanish that has y'all uh, because all of Spanish distinguishes between you and y'all. Most languages do. You is the second person singular, and y'all is the second person plural. And this is a helpful distinction to have, especially when it comes to Scripture or written communication in general. Simply put, it's the difference between speaking to an individual and speaking to a group. In Philippians 2.12, when Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, is that your singular or plural? And what I mean here is, is Paul telling each person in his audience as an individual or is he speaking to them collectively? It's ambiguous in English, but not in the Greek, so allow me the liberty of retranslating this for you. Therefore, my beloved ones, just as y'all have always been obedient, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your collective salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is work, at work within you all, enabling y'all both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is not just a, a feature of Philippians or even just the writing of Paul. The Bible as a whole is much more concerned with the group, the community, than the individual. That's clear in the Greek and the Hebrew, but it's something that's more obscure in English in our individualistic culture. The litmus test for many evangelical Christians, the way to know that you are saved, is whether or not you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Really, the more biblical test would be whether we, as a group, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe you might argue back, well, how can we know if we as a group have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, I can know what's in my heart, but how can I know what's on the hearts of others in the group? 
Well, Jesus himself had a few things to say about this. In John 13, 35, he says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. In another parable, Jesus says that there were two sons who were asked by their father to do something. One agreed to it, but then went away and changed his mind and didn't do it. The other said no to the father, but then changed his mind as well and did what the father had requested. Jesus asks us, who did the father's will? We as a group have a relationship with Jesus when we act according to God's will. And to, to, to illustrate that point, I have something that I want to show you all now. Um, and I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need probably eight or more volunteers. So can I go ahead and get some volunteers to come down front with me? This is something that I learned while I was a camp counselor, but don't worry, I'm not doing a trust fall or anything like that. Um, so y'all, I need eight people, come on down. Thank you, thank you, wonderful. So come on, don't be shy. All right, that's good, that's good. One or two more, one or two more. Come on down. There we go. And the little children shall leave them, right? All right, so I'm gonna need some of y'all in the front, in front of this, facing me, and some uh, on the side of the tent pole with me, okay? So some of y'all come over here on front, in front, spread yourselves out along the, the tent pole. All right, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna put out your fingers, oh, we got some, shorter individuals here, so we'll start a little lower, but you're gonna put out your fingers like this, and you're gonna put them underneath the tent pole, and you're gonna hold the tent pole up with your fingers, okay? Come on, come on down, everybody. Yep, everybody, you wanna come on this side and put your fingers on it, okay? So, um, now here, here's what I'm gonna tell you to do. There's one simple goal that y'all need to do. You're gonna need to lower this tent pole to the ground, okay? But there's also one rule. And that rule is, do not take your fingers off of the tent pole. If I see anybody move their fingers off of the tent pole, then we're gonna start over again, okay, right? So I'm gonna, on the count of three, y'all are gonna lower it to the gown, all right? One, two, three. All right, lower it to the ground. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, see, see children really will lead us. Yeah. So, so, Donna, do you want to tell them how this went with the early service? <laughs> well, let me just start by saying that um, the volunteers were uh, adults. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, that speaks volumes right there. And every single time, we, we had to try it several times because every single time, he asked us one, two, three, go. Our rod went up. So I don't really know what the magic is, yeah, but so, there so, is some magic. So let's try this again. Actually, can I get some adult volunteers now, now that you've seen some children do it? Come on, come on. Let's see if we can get some adults to do this. Fantastic, fantastic, come on out. And maybe it, was, maybe it was helping them, too, that they, they were a little closer to the ground already, right? So, so, again, the goal is to lower the tent pole to the ground, and you cannot take your fingers off the tent pole at any time. You ready? One, two, three. Wait, wait. Come on, let's try again. All right, one, two, three. Fingers on, fingers on the pole. Come on. The, to the ground, guys, to the ground. All right, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Hey, can y'all give them a hand so that maybe they can feel the encouragement? Come on. All right. What, ready? One, two, three. Down. Down. Down, guys. Down. 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 That's not down, guys. <laughs> All right. Let's give them a hand one more time.
And let's also give our, our, our youth and children who, who did that so admirably another hand. <laughs> I, I was worried about that when the kids come forward. I was like, sometimes the kids can do this, right? But um, for most groups, what happened the second time is what happened. And, and I wish you could have seen the early service. You can watch the video later. It just shot up every time. Uh, it just shot up. Um, and for most groups, that's exactly what happens. Rather than go down, the tent pole rises. Why would that happen? Well, think a bit about what I said to the group. I basically had two challenges there. The first was the collective goal, lowering the tent pole. And explicitly, that's what's most important, right? That is the, the purpose of the exercise. But I also gave one rule. Each person, as an individual, could not take their fingers from off of the tent pole. And that rule is what ends up trumping the overall goal most of the time. There are usually at least one or two people in any group who, without knowing it, they're, they're not conscious of this fact, but they're more focused on the rule of not taking their fingers off of the tent pole than the overall goal of lowering the tent pole. So in a group like this, everyone pushes up ever so slightly to make sure that their fingers are on that tent pole. And that causes the tent pole to rise rather than fall. It's a fascinating uh, study in human nature. And again, we, we, can, we can contemplate more about what it means that the kids uh, do it so much more easily as well. We fixate on individual rules to the detriment of group goals. I see this so much in the church with regard to sin and salvation. We focus on the rules, the, the sins, and we lose sight of the goal, salvation, of, of building God's kingdom of love and justice in the world. Let me give you another metaphor for this. Who here, if you're riding a bike, rides it while looking backwards over your shoulders like that? Anybody? Now, there may be some people out there who do just that, but I would wager they're probably in a hospital right now, right? Or who, if you're going to, to shoot basketball and, and shoot, shoot a free throw, will spend your time fixated on the ball instead of the goal, instead of the hoop? We tend to follow where our attention is directed. This is the challenge when, coming to, uh, when it comes to avoiding sin. The best way to beat sin is to focus on the good we want to accomplish, to focus on love and kindness, not to focus on the sin itself. If we focus on the sin in our lives, it's just human nature. We will follow where we place our attention. So if we're focused on sin, we're more likely to give in to temptation. In our tent pole example, I made sure to emphasize the rule of not taking your fingers off of the tent pole and stated a consequence that we would start over to fix that rule in your minds. And what was the result? We focus on the rule to the exclusion of the goal. The tent pole rises rather than going down. This is my last sermon here, at least while ser serving as your associate pastor. And while I think of what I would most like to impart to you, what I would most want to share, the most important lesson, I think, for this congregation to learn, it would be that your power, your strength, comes from all of you collectively working together. If you look around this room, there are a lot of talented, intelligent, successful, inspiring individuals here. There is an impressive pool of experience and wisdom in this sanctuary right now. And as impressive as you all are individually, you have the potential to be so much more collectively 
as a church. We are more than the sum of our parts. This church has done and will do such great things. And more than just that, this church, Central, is a part of the United Methodist Church. We, we pay apportionments and contribute to collective ministries that accomplish so more than if we were just on our own. The United Methodist Church has done remarkable things, for example, just one example, to, to reduce malaria around the world. That's not something this congregation could do, but it's something that we can do together as a church. Central is a wonderful place, but it is one of countless faithful congregations. Often people don't think about that broader church until times like this when the bishop moves a pastor. But these moves are a part of a bigger picture, a broader goal that we can't lose sight of. We are called to work together to build a better world where we can all feel and know God's love. Je Jesus didn't come so that just a small corner of Cabarrus County would know and love God. Jesus came to save us all, this whole world, without exception. We have everything we need to cure the sick, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to house the homeless. God has equipped us to deal with these problems, but we have to do it together. I've learned so much from you all. And I, I like to think that I've grown as a pastor and a person from my time in ministry with you all. I've seen firsthand the strength of this congregation. And I have no doubt, no doubt at all, that Tom and Savannah will be wonderful pastors who will serve this church well. But I also know that they are just two people. As wonderful as they are, they will be two among hundreds of other committed and talented and called members of this congregation. Among countless members of a global denomination. God has equipped this congregation for great things. It takes the group to meet the goal of lowering the tent pole. It takes individuals narrowly focused on the rules and the small picture to sabotage the goal. What kind of a church will Central be? It's up to y'all to decide. As I leave Central in a few weeks, know that I have nothing but gratitude and thanksgiving for the gift that each of you have been in my life. Thank you. Amen.